Okay, so if you're not getting the ping to prepare, let me know, get me your email and let me get it to you because um, we like to get you stirring up in the Word of God and seeing what he's doing. And sometimes the Lord, the Lord just constantly does crazy things with me, putting together graphics and then giving me a phrase. And this phrase, I'm just dying to live, has been, uh, he placed in me a, about a week ago, and it's just been haunting me ever since in the best way. You know the Spirit of God can haunt you, just so you know? Okay, yeah, he can kind of be there. So let me get through that, because we're going to head in. We're gonna, um, we have some brave souls who are going to venture into the cold, uh, into the pool in the backyard, and it's, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But why are we in this? And I don't know if you noticed the subtitle, The Delightfully Deadly Waters for New Life. <laughs> I know, sometimes you go, okay, what's with the phrase? Anyway, we'll get there. But we're in a month right now, biblically, that is tied to when the flood began. And also it's tied then a year and 10 days later when they finally emerged from the ark. And so the issue about God dealing with things um, and what needs to get killed off. And Peter writes and connects the dots to the bride of Christ saying that the water through which the ark safely passed symbolizes now the ceremonial washing through baptism that initiates you into salvation. You are saved not because it cleanses your body of filth, but because your appeal to God from a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus, the anointed, our liberating king. Yeah, so it's Peter that makes the connection directly to the flood. There's more parts of this passage I won't get into, but just to cover... A lot of you are going through some form of this. Anybody here? Okay. Bottom line, it's a deep issues are requiring cleansing. This is not a once lightly. This is where God's taking you in some deep waters and going, okay, we have got to clean some house here. And sometimes the way to do it is to flush it. Okay? I remember that word a few weeks ago, right? Okay. The old has to be killed off, and we always want it instantly, don't we? One and done, okay, we're good, thank you very much. And God's like, no, he wants it thoroughly. And so they were in that ark for a year and 10 days while God dealt with the deep level issues, okay? Sometimes God will take you in a process that's extended. Any of you in an extended process? Okay, I'm getting, yeah. The deep work is bottom line required for a new beginning. And why is that all so important? That cleansing, the waters, it would take more to go into it, but the waters represent judgment, okay? The judgment of the Lord to deal with the issues. Hello. Just so you know, the waters of baptism deal with judgment. And that what goes in can't come out the same way. What goes in's got to be judged and got to be died. Got to be died. Got to be killed. <laughs> you might be died too. You come out of the pool. Hey, I come. I'm green anyway. Sorry, it's all that you know allergy there. Why is that so important? It's because we're real good about quoting this phrase, and you know it well from Revelation 12. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And that is where the bulk of the church stops. But you cannot do that because there's an important and they did not love their lives to the death. So that part of the death part, but is that last part optional? Because trust me, I see a whole lot of part people that about the word of the testament, the blood of the lamb, and they're doing that. And then I often wonder, where's that other part? Is that something we're willing to do but hoping not to? <laughs> now, I want you to keep in mind that that was written ultimately about being martyrs, right? Hello. But it can also be about what you've got to die to. Hello? And if you're not doing that, you can be bearing some witness, and in the name of Jesus, by the power of the blood, and the demonic will sit there and look at you and go, oh, yeah, right. Because the demonic knows whether you're all in or not, or whether you're just saying it. 
like the seven sons of Sceva, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Jesus I know, Paul, you know, Paul I've heard of. Who the hell are you? Right? Because there was not the connect. Can we overcome without that last part? Yes or no? I don't think you really can. I think it's a threefold cord, and I think you've got to be connected to it. And the question, though, is do we need to actually desire it? Because that's where this crazy phrase, I am dying to live. Can you say that? I am dying to live. Okay, so where's the phrase come from? I'm dying to. According to Cambridge University, it's to be extremely eager to have or to do something, right? Pretty straightforward. By the way, when you're looking for pictures with longing in the eyes, sometimes it's not always that easy, so I found this one. Because frankly, it may be a dog, but it's all of us at different times about different things, right? Have you ever said this? You know, I'm just dying for a good cup of coffee. Yeah? Sometimes we use the other way. Oh, I'd kill for a good burger, right? It's kind of it's related to that. Now, this one's going around somewhere. Man, I'm just dying to see if Georgia can three-peat. Yeah? Okay. Bottom line, though, that phrase should indicate an intense passion and desire, right? Something very deep and a commitment to do whatever it takes to get there. So again, it's a funky phrase that I got. I am dying to live. Now, these two faces are very intense because I was trying to get a hold of something that communicated someone who was really focused and said, I am dying to live, and I'm not going to stop until I do. Hello? There are people who will get so fighting for, you know, against a disease or something that's going on because they're just determined, I will live and not die, right? They're determined. But within the body, there's a very different aspect that the only way you can truly live is to die. So it becomes a statement of longing, I'm dying to live, to a statement of fact, I am dying to live. Does this make some sense? Okay. So I just want to hit five things that just have kind of popped because God has been pressing me on this. And full disclosure, I am still a long way from getting it nailed. Okay. The old man, the old flesh, and all that other crap. Depends upon when you're around me. You're like, oh, my goodness. Does he even know Jesus at all? Okay. So any given moment, unlike the rest of you. Well, I know. And by the way, because all of you are so holy, before we have the baptisms, we're going to have a group of you walk on top of the water. And just <laughs> Number one. See, I don't have that problem. I just start to walk and I sink. I... Dying is the moment of victory. Number two. Dying is not the end, it's a means to the end. Sometimes we can get that confused. It's, by the way, it's not a means, it is the means. You want life? That's got to come. But dying is never, it's not our focus, our eyes stay fixed on the prize. And fifth, it's not that we overvalue our current lives and comfort, it's just that we undervalue the prize. So hopefully these will kind of make some sense. Dying is the moment of victory. You know, this did not occur to me until I, I have, I do go through some prayers and I have a structure to them. And part of them is when I'm speaking to Jesus and I'm thanking him for all that he did. And I'm talking about everything that he endured getting up to the cross, and particularly the separation from Father, and that he could have said just, no, enough. But he chose to remain, and he laid his life down of his own accord. No one took it from him. He surrendered his spirit, and he died. And I say, in Jesus, at that exact moment, though we couldn't see it or understand it, 
you triumphed over your foes by the cross. You made a public spectacle of them. You raided hell in the grave. You broke the bars and took the keys. See, there's a whole thing. And it wasn't, I mean, part of me was just thanking him for all he'd done. And, and the more that I was getting out of that, this has been revised. At, well, it's revised every day because it's a, it's a framework. I mean, I just, I speak with him. It's not something I say mindlessly. Um, but it helps to connect with all the amazing things he has done for me. But it just imprinted that that dying is the moment of victory. When Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. At that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earthquake, the rocks were split, tombs broke open, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. I always, you know, thought, you remember on Resurrection Sunday in the morning? Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. Okay, that would indicate it was only at the resurrection that that happened. That was kind of how my brain imprinted. No, 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 no. He wasn't just off in Cabo for those days getting a tan. He was raiding hell in the grave, preaching to the spirits that were in captivity. Peter talks a little bit about this. Breaking the bars, taking the keys, and then he led captives out. And so that just the reality of that for him, and this in Colossians 2, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The victory was at the cross at that exact moment. The validation to everybody was the resurrection, okay? We needed to see that part, but when Jesus said, it is finished, and then died, he meant it. And I kind of go, wait, no, 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 it's not done yet. He misspoke. You've got to be raised. Well, yeah, that is because of the new life and all, but the victory came in that, and that the same is true for us. See, it's hard when we feel like we have to die to something, and then we're waiting for the victory. You have to get in your head. The moment you make the decision to die to that thing, that is the victory. That's the moment. That's the divine moment. We have to enter into that. So there should be no fear of it. There should be no fear of our physical death. I think a lot of you are probably like me. I have no fear about my physical death. I worry a little bit about the process to get there, okay? But when it comes, I'm looking forward to it, okay? Because suddenly I'm free in a new way. No worries, no stress, no... None of that stuff, no, okay, I got to, you know, whatever, I'm free. And it occurred to me, why is it that I can look forward to that death, and I don't understand that any death I need to make now, thing I need to die to now, has the same upside. When I die to my thing and I let him, suddenly the stress and the worry and all that other stuff, can, do you understand? This is supposed to be a process where we understand those smaller, what we call smaller deaths, right, have the same upside of the freedom and the joy. See, anyway, does that make some sense? I was Saturday morning, some of my favorite time, because I just get to be with the Lord. I put on some great worship sets and just, it's just nice, because um, I'm not working at stuff. I'm just being, and um, I was listening to a worship set, and the woman sang this song from Hillsong in this one verse, to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. And then she kept coming back to, you did not despise the cross, Lord. You did not despise the cross. And it just struck me because I'm used to, he despised the shame. And you kind of equate that with the cross. Hello? But what the song is saying rightly is he didn't despise the cross. He didn't despise the death because that's where the victory was. Hello? That's where the victory was. That's why he still has the scars. Hello? 
Glorious body. Glorious body. Still got the scars. I love that. Is this kind of making some sense? Okay. So but when she was going over that, I kind of got a picture of myself just grabbing onto the cross with Jesus still hanging on it and just the blood from him just dripping down on me. And I just went, Lord, I got I to gotta do better at just dying to this old crap. I, I got to let that go better. So it, is this making some sense in terms of how it's stirred up? And by the way, the culture gets this also in a really big way. Levi's going to love this slide. How many of you remember the first Star Wars movie? Okay, 1977. I remember when it came out. We were so excited because there were these incredibly powerful themes in it. And this is the fight scene with Darth Vader. He says, you can't beat me, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. I mean, it was just like, oh, my goodness. That's Jesus, right? And then when he, when he goes and does the sword and the body's not there, we're like, oh! <laughs> okay? See, even the culture understands something about this because God still speaks to the pagan kings, the Nebuchadnezzars, okay, and the pharaohs, and then the men of God have to interpret what he's saying. Here's another. One of my favorite movies is from Gladiator. Maximus is confronting the false emperor, and he, he's, he's stretched out like this, and he's guy's going to try to kill him. And he says this line, a friend once said, death smiles at us all. All a man can do is smile back. See, you have to get this, folks. Death will smile at us all. Get the grim reaper out of your head. Okay, this is not... Do you understand that death is incredibly important for your transition and promotion? Now, some of you might be raptured. Some of you should be raptured now. Please, Lord, just no. <laughs> but see, let me, let, me, let me give you another Christian take on this. The opportunity to die on any number of things in your life smiles on you if you'll just smile back and go with it see that's what that saying is saying you just like it's like okay come on bring it come on come on come on i can do that why because i know where this is going because the second point is the dying isn't an end in of itself it's means to the end right paul is so unequivocal with this he says, we are always carrying in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Could it be any less clear here, folks? We carry in the body the death of Jesus so that. Say so that. So, that. so here's how this works. You want the life of Jesus in you, then you need to carry the death. You, you cannot get one without the other, folks. It's just, but it's a means to the end. You don't sit there longing to die just to die. Hello? Because then you're some sort of nihilist or something, okay? You have to understand it's for a reason. Because dying is not just a means, it is the means. Say the means. The means. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your life. And you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own, as you continually surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice and lose your lives for my glory, you will continually discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will forfeit what you try to keep. Traditional translation is unless you take up your cross daily and follow me. Right? I mean... But again, it, let's, let's give the current symbol. Any of you wear a cross? Okay. Let's change that now to an uh, electric chair. Or better, may, maybe it needs to be one of the medical gurneys with the arm straps where they do the lethal injection. 
See, you know, we've got a lot of romanticized to it now. I'd really like to go by a church with a steeple and instead of the cross, it's got an electric chair. It'd just be interesting. Hello? Well, come on. Do you, do you understand that, that, you know, now the early church really didn't start using that until about the third century. That's when it shows up on things. But, but you have to get that they, there was so much shame with that. I mean, that was used for Rome to humiliate and degrade people. They would capture people. They would triumph over them. They would just set out crosses along the roadways. And it would take a typical person three days to die on a cross. I mean, it was awful. It was horrible. And yet, that's, let's say we've missed something. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. It's the old joke about present yourself as a living sacrifice. And the problem with a living sacrifice is it always crawls off of the altar. We're not very good at keeping there. Am I being too heavy or are we just kind of, okay. I'm just trying to help you understand, folks. This is like, I was reading an article, John Piper. Um, we had the same professor in, uh, at Fuller. But he was talking about when Peter wrote this to the church and about baptism in the waters. He was trying to prepare them to suffer. And he said, you need to understand this. The United States makes up about 5% of the world. And the American experiment, the couple hundred, 300 years that we've had, makes up about 5% of time. We have this rarefied atmosphere of having freedom of religion where being a Christian is pretty normative. For the 95% of the world and the 95% of the time, it has never been that way. And persecution has been regular. And Paul and Peter and all the rest of them understood that to have a witness for Christ was, not, was likely to cost you your life. And we just now live in such a rarefied atmosphere. That's why we... They, <laughs> they would look at... If I was talking to the early church about this, they'd look at me like, you're a moron. We know all this. There's ways I was going before the Lord going, Lord, can't be great if I had one of the guys from the prison come and talk about this. Because you talk about a guy who's having to live with that, right? I mean, what am I? What do I really know? Comparison. You okay? No, it's kind of, okay. So, the dying is A means not, is not A. So here's another one from Jesus. Let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies. Because then it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat all because one grain died. The person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. But the one who detaches his life from this world and abandons himself to me will find true life and enjoy it forever. See, Jesus is constantly setting this contrast. you got to get the death right because if you want the life, it's how you get there. If you want life in this world, guess what? You have to be willing to die and come out of the womb. Hello? Now nah, I'm going to stay in here. I don't care what they're doing. I see that suction thing. You're not getting me. Some of you had kids like that. Okay, here's, here's another line, just giving you movie and culture. Band of Brothers, a pretty intense scene. How many of you watched that and seen it? The guys have? This guy, Lieutenant Ronald Spears, is based on true characters. But one of the things, he's, he's dealing with a new recruit who's really nervous, I mean, literally trembling. And he says this to him, the only hope you have is to accept the fact that you're already dead. The sooner you accept that, the sooner you'll be able to function as a soldier is supposed to function. <laughs> I'll tell you, folks, the sooner we, we accept the fact that we're already dead. I'm dead. It is no longer I who lives. I am crucified with Christ. Do you say that on a regular basis? Do you affirm it? Okay, it's one of the things that I pray when I'm putting on the armor of God. You're probably sick and tired of hearing me about what I do, but I, I have to armor up, and that's part of the belt of truth. Lord, I put on the belt of truth, the truth is it's all about you, it's not about me, you are the hero of the story, and I belong to you. 
My life is not my own. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. You're in the beginning and the end, and you're all up and in this messy middle, and you're all up and in my business. And because I'm crucified with the Christ by the cross, I am dead to the world, its temptations and timetables and pressures and expectations, and anyways, those percolate up and through your body, and all those things are dead to me. That's part of what I affirm on the belt of truth, folks. And I make that statement to Jesus. I'm not making it out to the air. It's, I'm saying, I get this, and I'm wearing it. And the more that I speak it, the more my body comes in line with it, right? Okay. You good with this? Okay. So, the dying is not our focus. Our eyes are fixed on the prize. You know, they were back in the days, right, with the monks and everything, and the, they take the cat and nine tails and whip themselves, you know, and just do all this stuff for, it's like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> that is not the focus. We keep fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, this ability to keep fixed on the prize was clear for Jesus. I mean, to deal with the agony of body that he dealt with, to have all that skin ripped off of him, to have been paraded through town, and on and on and on. But biggest of all, to have the Father turn away from him. I just... Somehow, how, do you, how does he endure that? He kept his eyes on the prize. The joy set before him. He says, okay, i got to get through this moment, and then it's there. Paul says, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, my reward. And we, with all unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. Right? The, the beholding the prize I mean, we'll get in a minute to law of displacement. Fifth problem, we overvalue versus undervalue. It's not that we overvalue our current lives and comfort. It's that we simply undervalue the prize. We, we don't understand <laughs> the gift of life. I asked in the, in the ping how many that St. Uh, Arenas said, the glory of God is a man fully alive. And I said, how many believers do you know are really fully alive? And I answered back, not, not many. I don't know many. Right? Why is that? We don't value it enough, so we keep holding on to all the little crap. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went out and sold all he had. Did you get this line? In his joy, went out and sold, died to all that in joy. I'm dying to all that because I know where this is. This is an amazing quote from C.S. Lewis. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. <laughs> Yeah, because we're so busy making the mud pies, we don't, we don't, for the joy set before him, he dealt with that. So, <clears throat> any of you need help on what needs to die? Maybe, maybe not. But, but here's where I want you to get. What is your perspective about you? This is really important because otherwise you can fall prey into legalism, into a lot of condemnation, and that ain't the way it gets done. David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
When was the last time you claimed that? Will you read this? Say it. But but do you, I mean, you say that, but do you, do you really, I mean, not just every part of you? Because the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. My profound belief is that each person, when you come again into Jesus and there is something reclaimed in you that is a glory DNA that is unique to you, that is a fragment of the glory of God Almighty that is set in you. And that's what creation is waiting and longing for. And it's there and it's in you. But we're like this guy. There's so much crap and crud around it a lot of times. Okay? Our heart is to see you free, first from the sin, and then second from the religion. So who you're supposed to be really comes out brilliantly. Hello. That's why we don't have a format of what you're supposed to be, because we don't always know. We just want you to be free from that garbage so that whatever that radiance is, it shows up. This is, again, one of the things when I have on the belt of truth, okay, that I am your true son. You love me deeply, but you enjoy me even in my brokenness and my failings. And I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and I carry a fragment of your glory in me, and we enjoy each other's company, and we're going to do so in increasing amounts forever. That's part of the truth I live in might want to try something with God to affirm that. Hello? Because see, you got to get what's in there so that when it comes to the dying to that old stuff, you'll go, well, wait, why would I want to make mud pies when I can go to the sea for a weekend? I don't want that crap. What is unique and powerful glory that is dying in you to come out? See, I'm dying to live. You, you have to get this, the fullness of life. John 10.10, 10, right? I hadn't... We use that slide a lot inside. Thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I would come that you would have life and have it abundantly. You know, if, if we as the body of Christ really had that life abundant, <laughs> if we really walked it, could you imagine the change going on? Because people would go, okay, what is with you? You're not phony, you're present, but you're just, why are you this way? What are you smoking? What, what supplements are you taking? You know, I, I got, I want whatever that is, I, I need some of that, right? We're told, you know, be ready at all times to give a defense for the hope that is within you. John Eldridge has this line, what's the last time somebody came up to you in the supermarket and say, oh, excuse me, I guess, would you just tell me you're so full of hope? Where's it? Tell me. It doesn't happen, right? We're not, we're not. But see, there's a glory, and it doesn't mean it's going to be all, you know, soft and light. It can be intense. It can be passionate. That's the glory, the fierceness of God. So, Talked about this before, but when you go out, look around, because all creation is going, ah, I see that one. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Oh, that's really dim, but come on, 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 come on. It says all creation is longing, folks. All creation, current, present tense, ongoing, longing. So the question is just in the crud and crust, but it's always about looking for what's the glory inside. And over the last two weeks ago, I guess, I, I delved into this quite a bit about things that stand in the way of new beginnings. And I'm going to do these backwards because they're a little easier to take this way in back order. Number one that keeps you stuck and often unwilling to die and enter into a new beginning is just distractions. You just got so many things flitting around. God says, look, let's deal with this so you can get free. And you're like, okay. No, I mean, let's get you free now. Okay. Squirrel, yeah. Squirrel, okay. The other is comfort. I have a, I have a handful of you that are going to get baptized today, and it's going to be 50 degrees outside, and I don't know what the water temperature is. It's going to be cold, okay? I had a number of you decide, no way I'm going out there. It's too cold. Now, I, it's not a judgment. I'm just saying a lot of times it's comfort. We want, yeah. 
Okay, you understand. No, I'm comfortable this way, God. Yeah, but I want to free you so this is just so that you have more life. But I'm comfortable this way. Entitlement is a big one. No, 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 no. I don't need to. I, no, no, no. Last one is resentment. Man, bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, they're just killers, killers, killers. Primary cause for cancer is unforgiveness, folks. AMA will tell you that. AMA can diagnose left or right breast cancer, whether in a man or a woman, whether it has to do with an issue with a, a mom or female or a male kind of thing or other relative. It's gotten that clear. This is what it is. A lot of you have already been working on these, right? Because you want the new beginning. We just have to get aware of how these things percolate around. Go back, watch the replay again. It's, I'm still working on mine, trust me. How do you like this perspective? It's from inside the dug grave. So let me again give you this from Paul. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Baptism always has to do with burial. Okay? The waters are about the judgment of God as they were in the ark. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The death and the life, folks. You want more life of Jesus in you, yes or no? Yes. Okay. It's not complicated. <laughs> but I tell you, I wrestled with even wanting to bring this because it's like, okay, God, this is a great word. This is going to be a really enthusiastic kind of thing. You know, Can't we just do something about moving forward in the fight and the battle and everything else? And it's like, okay, here we go. For if we've been united together in likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. This is stuff you all know, right? I'm just bringing it fresh to you. So, here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Folks, the promises are many. Right? It's, it's really, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. The issue is that we know it, sort of, and we don't grasp it, and we're not walking it. And those five reasons are, are part of it. And by the way, when it comes to baptism, some of you kind of try to do it this way. I might have gone in, but I ain't going back. I'm going to live up on the surface of the water here. I just thought that was a funny picture, right? But Jesus' words again, let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies. You want to change? You want a new beginning? Okay. But see, keep that in mind. I'm going for this. Don't, if you get fixated... You can't, the dying is the means to the end. I'm doing this, I'm dying to live. I am dying to live. So, let me give you a couple other things. How about some weight training? There's something called the law of displacement. So, it's better, when you're trying to move into a new area, it's better that you not say, I will not be selfish. I will not be selfish, 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 okay? The problem is you keep using the same word. And it's like this rubber band, you know, that's attached to a wall, and the more you try to move away from it, the more the tension increases until it gets to a point where it snaps you back, right? And the enemy's going to be right there because as soon as you do something like that, he's going to go, see, you are selfish, you are selfish, you are selfish. And you'll come in agreement with that and go, oh, God, I can't, you know. Instead, what's better is I will be generous. 
I will be generous. Even better than that is, I am generous. I'm not there, but I am generous. Just make the decision. If that's your issue that you got to deal with, I am generous. Hello? Speak the things to be. Part of my other declarations about the belt of truth, and I am a man of God and a man after your heart. Okay? Am I fully there? No, but I have been confessing that for years. And I believe that it happens more and more all the time. So, did that, I will not, I'll be generous, I am generous. Or how about this, I will not hate him, I will not hate him, I will not hate him, I will stop hating him. That doesn't work quite so well. How about this, I am loving to him, I am loving to him. See, again, you got to get, we, we get caught sometimes just in the emotion. The emotion follows, it's the action. Love your neighbor isn't like, oh, I just think they're so sweet. It's Okay? It's the Good Samaritan. We have no idea how he felt about him. He just did that. Greater love has no man than this, that he swoons in his presence. No. Greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. See, it's an action. Hello? Okay. I will not hate him, but I'm loving him to this point. I love him. I love him. I love him. Yeah? The law of displacement is that it's easier to bring something in that displaces that old. That's so often how that death works. And the more life of Jesus you have in you, the more it will push out the dead. Hello? But the death is necessary. I love this from Paul. Finally, brothers and sisters, fill your mind with beauty and truth. Meditate on whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, whatever is virtuous and praiseworthy. Folks, if we just took that, we would start being so much more alive. But instead, we're filling our minds with what? Fear and trepidation and criticism and blah, 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 blah. Hello. No? None of you have that problem. <laughs> okay. So, when the early church would baptize someone, it's pretty good evidence that this is what, when they would put them under the water, this is what the balance of the congregation would say. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Okay? So say this. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. One more time. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You think you have that down? Okay, some of you do, some of you don't. Because when we go outside, we have a different procedure for when we baptize, right? And most of you know, some of you don't, some of you are online. And it's simply this, because the focus is supposed to be that when you go down, you die. <laughs> And I've never quite understood how quickly people die with this. I just, I just don't. And you know what? This is probably a lot of the problem is that we don't really die. We kind of get a taste of death. Hello. No? Come on. Well, that was good. Okay. I got a little bit there. Okay. So you got a little bit of life sometimes. Now, I'm not, I'm not getting legalistic about this, but it's important. So when we put you down there, we, we have, you, you know, have your hand there somewhere. And I just let you know that I'm just going to put you down, and I'm going to keep you down there until you just signal me that you want to come up. I'm serious. And for some folks, that's pretty fast. Some folks are like, okay, I'm going to be macho and try to, you know, be under here for five minutes, at which point we're going to worry. But, but no, but the idea being, I'd encourage you, those of you getting baptized, you go down and you let out all the water, and you just let it sink in. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm dying. Let, let the death become more real, you know? And then signal, and you come up. But here it is. While you're down, I'd like some of you to be able to shout out, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See, I suspect that in the early church they knew something about this because they had held them down at least that long for the congregation to say it. 
because they understood when you go under the waters, you're dying. And so arise now. Christ will shine on you. So who's getting baptized tonight? I know some. Okay. So, um, and who else? Yep, one's back there. Is there somebody I can't see? Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to, in a minute, I'm going to wrap up in prayer here, and uh, then we're going to go outside, and you're going to, we're going to get down by this end of the pool, and I'm going to take, um, okay, hold your hands up again. So, uh, Kim's coming in first, and uh, Shelly, and Penny, and Stephanie, uh, Rebecca, Natalie, and then we're going to go with the guys, Duke. Stephen, Joe, Juan, you good for holding up the rear there? The last one? Okay. Oh, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, in just a second. So we'll do that in that order. Um, it will be a little bit cold, so don't feel like you got to stand around once you come out of the water wet, okay? We're, we're practical about this. But I need you to get this. Much of the church will tell you this is just a ceremony or a ritual, okay? We believe in the sacrament that there is a grace that is available to you, okay? That when you go to truly break off and die to that stuff, that God honors that. Hello? That it's not just a ritualistic thing. It's not just a symbol. There's a transaction that happens. And the Lord honors that. And the angels and the demonic recognize it on you. We, we had one woman, when I baptized her, she said when she was coming up, all she could hear, she was getting delivered. Things were coming off her. And what she was hearing was, hit the road, Jack. I don't want you back no more, no more. Okay? That, that can well happen, okay? Because they don't want to die. If you physically die at some point, anything that's on you wants to transfer somewhere else. It's the same. When you go under that water, they're like, okay, whoa. I'm dying to live. Say, I'm dying to live. I know that's a silly phrase, but I kind of think there's some juice on it. I want to encourage you. Lord, I'm dying to live. I am just dying to live. How many of you literally want to live more? I mean, more vibrant, more alive, more humor, more joy, more every, okay, more, more, more just passion. Yeah. I'm dying to live, God, so I'm dying to live. Okay? Father, thank you. Oh, Penny's got a thing, so come bring this up, and then I'll. So this, so this afternoon, I was just sort of seeking the Lord about baptism, and he gave me five short things. So if you're being baptized, I'm prophesying this over you. He said, when, you're, when you go in the waters, it's going to wash the target off your back. That the, that the enemy has painted there, what's tried to wear you down, the target on your back is going to be washed off in the water. He said you're going to have an altitude change that rats and snakes can't handle high altitudes, that you're going to be able to soar. The weights that's kept you down is going to be off of you. You're going to be able to soar. He said, I'm going to crack and break strongholds. Mm. I'm going to crack and break strongholds. He said, bitter root judgments and expectancy is going to lose the legs they are standing on. Bitter root judgments and expectancies will lose the legs they are standing on. And the last thing, he said, the old is coming off. The old you, the old identities, the old projections, the old patterns, the old mistakes you've carried, and the new is going to emerge triumphant. Amen. Does this make sense, folks? Eyes on the prize, okay? Death is the victory, okay? <laughs> Jesus knows that. Yep, that's when it happened. That's what had happened. That's why the earth shook. That's why graves were open. That's why the temple curtain was torn in half. You have to get this. That moment decision. That's what it it breaks it open. Angels are going, yeah, because they know there's life that goes then immediately. Okay? And keep your eyes though. It's not the dying is a means to an end. Eyes on the prize. Always on the prize. Don't undervalue that. 
Don't undervalue that. Father, your word is so powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. I, I hope I've handled it rightly here. Oh, Lord, you know, I so want the glory that you've set in each person here free. I know I'm going to get to see it eventually, Lord, in heaven, but I'd like to see it in the earth. Along with creation, I long for the glory of the sons and daughter of the king to be revealed. So, Lord, I ask that this night marks a significant breaking open where that glory is revealed. Lord, where we really are dying to live. We're dying to live. We want the vibrancy. So people literally come up to us and say, what is with you? Jesus, thank you for what you endured and that you laid your life down of your own accord and no one took it from you. Lord, we honor everyone in this room who is working for that very thing to lay their life down so that your life breaks forward into them in new ways. In the name of Jesus, amen.